Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Welcome everyone to Williams. Good to see you all here this morning. Um, if you are visiting with us, look to the end of the pew and there should be a little slim sheet of paper. Um, a couple of questions. If you could just fill that out and put it in the offering plate so we could have a record of your visit, that would be marvelous. Now there's a lot going on at Williams, of course, it always is. So we've got a couple of announcements this morning. And first, some handsome people are going to come up here and do that. So Jake and Wendell and the gorgeous Patsy, they have some announcements to make. So y'all come on up in that order if you'd like. Or ladies first, I don't care. Since I'm already up, I guess I'll go first. Uh, thanks to everybody that came out for the work day Saturday. The cemetery looks really good. And uh, second of all, we need to have a brief, uh, what am I trying to say, cemetery committee meeting after church, and all members are encouraged to attend, and we just kind of got to go over a couple of things, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Wendell said it's my turn, so. <laughs> um, Relay for Life for Calhoun County uh, is about a month earlier than we than usual. It's usually around the first week of May, and it's April Friday, April 15th at 6 p.m. to 12 a.m. at Oxford High School. And we will again have our um, First Baptist Church of Williams team, Team Roy. And our two main ways of raising money is donations and uh, also uh, the Luminaria bags. Um, they're $10 and these forms are in the foyer. And if you want to just uh, grab a form, um, fill, one, fill it out and uh, purchase the bags in honor or memory of uh, someone that you know and love that's either um, had cancer and won or um, what you know the situation that um, that you want to honor uh, or in memory of someone. Um, these are ten dollars and the night of relay they are placed all around the track it's a it's a bag with the name on the outside with a uh, a glow stick candle on the inside and they turn the lights off and and it, it glows around the track and they also um, put them in the stands and they it spells out hope and it's it's, a, it's really really neat and the other um, is a torch for $75 and these are really nice and they're displayed the night of relay and a with a, uh, a plaque that has the name of the person in honor or in memory of. Um, so those are our two main ways and you can uh, fill these forms out and uh, return them or get them to uh, Carol, myself, um, Eva, or Patty. Um, and we'll get that, those uh, taken care of or you can also go online uh, at the <coughs> RelayForLife.org slash Calhoun County, Alabama, and join our team. Um, and you can also purchase the uh, Luminaria bags and the torches uh, there. <clears throat> um, and just scroll down. Uh, there's a lot of First Baptist churches, so our our team starts with Williams Baptist and Team Roy. So when you're scrolling, we're the only Williams on there, but we won't be First Baptist Williams because there's so many other First Baptists. We put it in as Williams Baptist. Um, the Survivor Dinner <clears throat> will be at 5 on the same day uh, as the relay. So if you're a cancer survivor and would like to uh, be a part of that Survivor Dinner, it's a really special uh, time uh, you can see Carol or myself and we will help get you signed up for that dinner we're not sure what the deadline is to sign up but it's probably pretty soon because relay is only a month away and that's one other thing the deadline for the torch uh, getting the torch <coughs> form turned in is April 1st and the uh, luminaria bags is April 7th so um, just uh, we wanted to get the word out today since Relay is about a month earlier than we uh, were expecting it to be. So um, just find those forms in the four-year and, um, and we'll uh, Relay. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, I was just going to... Uh, give everyone a little bit of a heads up of uh, 
a mission mission project. Actually, there's three coming up. There, I'll explain a little bit. It sounds like a, a big hill climb, but it's not. But we look. Myself and Chris and Tyler and Jim was going to go with us and things come up. But this past Friday, we rode down to uh, Perry County, uh, Marion, Alabama. I don't, most of you may have been through there or whatever. You, but anyway, that is part of uh, uh, Perry County is part of sowing seeds of hope. And I know all of you heard that before. And I can't remember, somebody would have to help me remember how many years ago it's been that we actually went down uh, another time and wound up that time staying overnight and uh, doing several uh, projects in Perry County. And over the last couple of Brotherhood breakfasts, breakfasts that we've had, uh, we, we brought it up again about Perry County and want to go back and, and, and do something meaningful. I know that, that, that sounds bad to say it that way, but that's how I said it this morning. But, but anyway, we went down and met with Frances Ford, and uh, she carried us around, and, and most, if anybody that went last time, we went way out of town. That's where the projects were. This time there within I won't say rock throwing distance one another, but they're all located really right in the, the downtown part of uh, Marion. I'll tell you what what they are. One of them is a, a, a simple thing as a wheelchair ramp on the back of a house for a elderly woman that needs that, that needs one desperately. The other one is a, a por putting a porch this almost fixing to fall to another big wind that lie be on the ground. The, the, uh, the last project is, uh, is putting a roof back on. And I don't, when I say a roof, I'm not talking about tear the whole top off of a house and redo it. It's to fix just a, a damaged part. I, wanted to, I just wanted to make this announcement to, you, to anyone this morning, this here, and someone else can make this same announcement next week. Our goal is to go, is to get as many people that want to go and to try to take care of these projects by the first week of April and no later than the second week of April. They, they, need, to, they, need, to be, they need to get taken care of. So I say that this morning, giving everyone the heads up. If you have to talk to your employer, or is there any way that you can take off? And the larger the, the larger the group we got, the faster these things get done. I said we stayed over last time. There's a big enough army. You may go down there and may be back by supper time. Who knows? But we'll play that by ear. And uh, I just wanted to let everyone know and give them a heads up. If you're, if you're interested in going to Perry County, uh, start trying to make preparations for it. Uh, thank you. All right, now it's my turn. Very quickly, open your bulletins. Make sure you come back tonight. Evening worship in here, 6 o'clock. Um, at 4 o'clock in the sanctuary here, there will be a church council meeting. So if you are a chairperson, it's important that you come. Um, Wednesday night supper, there's the menu there. Make sure you get on the list and be here at 530. And then um, 630 will be our usual devotion time and children and youth activities. Um, just know that... The egg hunt, the glow-in-the-dark egg hunt is coming up soon, in a couple of weeks. It's going to be on a Wednesday night of Holy Week, and it will start at 6.30. So uh, we need your help with donations. So read that information about the egg hunt. We need a lot, um, so please be willing to help. And right below that announcement is about our summer mission trip um, that's coming up in June, and it's to the Rio Grande Valley in Texas. And um, if you don't think you can make it, but you want to help out somehow, we are always in need of funds. So if you would like to sponsor, help sponsor some of us that are going, that would be great. If you would like to donate for supplies, you, your help is needed. 
And then if you look on the back of the bulletin, uh, Easter offering. Do not forget about the Easter offering. Uh, there's the uh, numbers that we have collected so far and what we do need to collect and that can be done. It's easy. And also I want to highlight Punch and Paint. Tonight where we treat punch and paint. Um, and that's coming up the 21st of March and that will be a fundraiser for the youth but I'm going to show you how to paint a cross that will be a wreath, wooden cross. So see me if you're interested in that. All right. Enough yapping. You've been sitting way too long, and I know you've seen someone you want to give a kiss on the cheek to, because I have. Or you want to hug their neck, or you just want to shake their hand and say good morning. So now's the time. Go do it. Good morning. good morning. It's good to see you all here on this uh, this Sunday morning. Should we wait and see who see? So we can point and laugh at the folks who come struggling in and uh, running in, doing their hair. Oh, I forgot, I forgot. Uh, well, it is good to see you all here an hour early, whether the clock says it or not, uh, this morning as we've gathered together for worship. And as we have, let us begin our time together with a word of prayer. Great God, as we have come into this place to worship you, we trust, Lord, that you have gathered here with us this morning. So, Lord, help us to feel your presence in this time of worship as we sing songs of praise, as we give of ourselves, our tithes, our offerings, as we listen for a word from you in Holy Scripture. God, help us to feel your presence among us. and Help it, Lord, to be a presence that changes us more into the likeness of your son, Jesus, whose name we come to worship and in whose name we pray. Amen. During the 40 days of Lent, the Christian church prepares to observe the Lord's passion and resurrection. We examine ourselves as we remember the suffering and the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. In this season of repentance and fasting, we come to terms with our mortality and our need for God's mercy. The candles around this cross represent Jesus' life and ministry. Each week, we extinguish another candle as we draw closer to the dark day of crucifixion. <clears throat> the scripture reading this morning is from Mark 10, 35 through 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? <clears throat> and they said to him, Grant us to sit at one at your right hand and one at your left in, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, Rulers lorded over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not <clears throat> so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. 
For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as, as a ransom for many. We extinguish the fifth candle as we remember the, desires, the disciples' selfish desire for power. John and James wants to be greater than the other disciples. They want authority over others, prominence, recognition. This kind of ambition which is so valued in the world has no place in the kingdom of God. To become great, one must be a servant. Serving others is at the core of Jesus' mission to give his life as a ransom for ours. Pray with me. <clears throat> Jesus, we live in a world scratching and clawing for more authority and recognition. We confess we are tempted by the false promises of ambition. We confess we want the opposite of your mission. We don't want the cross. We want to be served rather than to serve. Change us, Jesus. Help us to find the joy in serving one another. May we be a community that looks different than the rest of the world. Instead of being marked by ambition and jealousy, may we be known as a community that loves and serves sacrificially. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. While they're making their way back to the choir loft, go on and grab out your hymnal, turn to 488. The choir's going to sing a little chorus, and then we're going to ask you to join us on that great old hymn, okay? Oh, no. 
Y'all are good. Now, since you've sung with the choir, you can join the choir <laughs> starting next Sunday, okay? You've all been uh, hired. Just come on. Let's keep the singing going. You can remain standing. 399 says, I am pressing on the upward way to higher ground. Let's sing it. with me today. And these rocks are very special for, for me. Where I got these rocks is when we went on our mission trip to Haiti, when the church went to Haiti. Some beaches have sand. I'm sure y'all went to a beach that has sand. Well, these beaches have rocks. Y'all want to touch them? See how smooth they are? You want to feel them? You want to feel them? You do? I actually have a couple. You do have a couple of rocks like this? Yeah. You want to touch it? How about you? Okay. I see a lot of rocks like this. You do? Okay. Well, these rocks are going to talk to us today. They're going to sing praises, and they're going to talk to us today. What do you think about that? You think it's funny? Okay. Well, our scripture today comes to us from Luke chapter 19, verse 40. And it says, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Okay? Okay, so we're going to be talking about Palm Sunday. Do y'all know anything about Palm Sunday? Have we talked about it before? Uh-uh. Had never talked about it? Abby, now you can tell me something about Palm Sunday. Oh, um, yeah. Okay. What do you want to say? Remember? Sierra, you know anything about Palm Sunday? No? Okay. Well, I'm going to read you my story about Palm Sunday. Okay, Jesus was walking with his disciples towards Jerusalem when they approached Bethany near the Mount of Olives. He called two of his disciples to him and said, Go until the next village where you will find a young donkey. Bring it to me. If anyone asks why you are taking the donkey, just tell them the Lord needs it. The disciples did as they were told and brought the young donkey to Jesus. They threw their garments over it so Jesus could ride on him. As he rode, crowds were lying in the streets, and they began praising to Jesus and shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. They were creating quite a stir, and some of the religious leaders didn't like it. They asked Jesus to keep his followers quiet. But Jesus answered them and said, If they remained silent, the stones would immediately begin to cry out. Okay, so if these rocks to talk to this morning. What do you think they would say? Mm. What's some of your favorite Bible stories? Levi, what's your favorite Bible story? Mm -hmm. Come on, you've got one. Tell me one. <laughs> Ada, what about you? What's your favorite Bible story? It could be any of them. Jonah, the whale. What's another one, Sierra? 
Can you think? Uh, David and Goliath. What's another one, Abby? Come on. <laughs> Y'all forgot all of your Bible stories this morning? No, I, I have yeah, it. I you haven't? Okay. Can you tell me one? Tell me, a, tell me your favorite Bible story. Joseph. Joseph. Awesome. Joseph in the coat of many colors. What's that one? Yes, that's a good one. I like that one, too. I like Joseph, too. You like Joseph, too? Okay. Well, these stones have a lot of stories they could tell, but we won't let them. Just as the followers of Jesus lined the streets to praise their king, you and I are here to praise our king today. So as long as we praise them, these rocks, they don't have to talk because we're going to praise our king, right? Okay. Well, I'm going to pray before we go to children's church, okay? Y'all ready? Dear Lord, thank you for this day, and thank you for all the children that are here with us. Thank you for your many praises, and please, dear Lord, during this um, Easter season, just help us to always praise your name on high. These things we ask in your name. Amen. You You want to go see your daddy now? Okay. (laughs) Okay. Well, y'all get to go to children's church with Miss Courtney. Praise the Lord. This is one of my all-time favorite hymns. It's number two in your book. You can remain seated as we sing this wonderful hymn of faith. Come thou fount of every blessing. Everyone sing it. sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God he to rescue me from danger he bought me with his precious blood isn't that, isn't that great isn't that great to know that that he rescued you when you were a stranger and you were wandering Praise the Lord. Let's stand as we sing this final wonderful verse. Oh, to grace, how great. eternal life by sending your son Jesus to die for our sins. You've provided us with family, friends, and a wonderful place to gather to worship you. Help us to always recognize the blessings you send our way and to be cheerful givers as we return a portion of these gifts to you. Help us to use these offerings to work together, to touch the lives of others, and to share your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
be seated. Before the choir sings, I want to personally invite you to an event. You may have seen the poster out front or back here in the choir room. Duncan's going to have some sign-up sheets for that next week, but it's just a gospel concert going on in Oxford that I am uh, honored to be a part of, but all the information is on the poster, so feel free to go back and read that and sign up. would love to have a wonderful group of, of the church family uh, there to be uh, with us. I love this song and the way that the choir sings it. Heather and Sean worship along with us as we sing above all.
The Lord be with you. Sometimes preaching after the choir sings is like batting after Babe Ruth in the lineup. You just kind of hope you get on base, really. So, well, this morning we'll be listening to the th- uh, from the third chapter. Thank you, choir. Pat, Sean, man, we want to get you to do solos more. Huh? <laughs> Heather, you're good too. <laughs> no, but no. Um, but thank all of you this morning. Uh, we have definitely been to church, and I hope that we can continue to hear a word from the Lord this morning. The third chapter of Paul's epistle to the Philippians, beginning with the second half of verse 4, reading through verse 14. If anyone has, else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the sharing of His sufferings by becoming like Him in His death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock, our redeemer, and friend. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, a couple of times a month, Sally and I will spend about half a day hitting up the thrift stores around the county. Now, Sally goes more often than that. Don't let her tell you she doesn't. I mean, uh, you know, I think they have posters of her in some thrift stores. That's all I'm going to say about that. Thrift stores are great places to find bargains on everything from blue jeans to golf clubs. You can even find wedding dresses and car parts if you go to the right store on the right day. And when Sally and I go, we usually follow sort of the same routine. We come in the door, Sally heads for the clothes, the children's books, uh, maybe the toy section, you know, stuff that's worth getting at a thrift store, but I, I always go for the section that I lovingly call the junk. And you know what the junk is at a thrift store, don't you? It's usually pushed somewhere in the back of the store, maybe uh, in some dimly lit corner, or maybe they even keep it in another room and they put plastic sheeting over the door so nobody will be embarrassed about being seen perusing the items therein. It's this kind of stuff that when folks donate it, the store is too nice to tell them we don't want it. You know, it's the kind of stuff, they, 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 they like bent butter knives or, or skillets without a handle, velvet-looking paintings of boys picking grapes, random wood cuttings of ducks wearing bonnets, coffee mugs with words like Accountants Convention Las Vegas 1998, or those old big orange and pink sort of mugs you used to get at gas stations that say beach bum on them. And then there are all those crock pots. They're all crock and no pot. (laughs) You can find some pretty interesting things strewn all about junk in in the junk pile at the thrift store. You might find that thigh master you've been wanting. (laughs) The other half of that pair of scissors you've been needing. Or maybe even a complete set of jelly jars turned juice glasses for your cupboard. There's really no telling what you'll find when you take time to look through that bunch of junk. But to tell you the truth, I don't look at it because I'm looking for something. One of the reasons I like looking through that junk is because I'm always curious about the story of how it wound up there. 
How someone went from one day in the past buying something brand new, something they needed, something they likely spent more than 15 cents on, how they went from that to sacking it up and dropping it off at some thrift store for some old fool like me to spend the better part of a morning just staring at. At some point, everything in that pile, everything on the shelves in that dark corner of that thrift store was brand spanking new. And it was one of the best of its kind. The newest of the new. A needed object that somebody bought and that blister packaging brought home to be put to good use. At some time in the past, every item on those shelves occupied a space either in somebody's kitchen drawer, on their wall, or a special place on their shelf. Because they wanted it, because they needed it, because they liked it, or maybe they were even a little proud of it. And now it sits among the rest of the junk with masking tape and crayon, 15 cents, until it's eventually bought, or as I think most of it is, thrown out in the dumpster. Now imagine, imagine for a moment, if everything you own You thought about it that way. That you had the mindset that everything you own, everything you will buy, will one day wind up in that bunch of junk. Or maybe in a landfill somewhere. Maybe someday, eventually, everything you've labeled as mine will be sacked up, hauled off, sold out in somebody else's driveway, or burned up with a brush pile. How might that change the way you think about your stuff? Would you hold on to it a little tighter? Or maybe you'd relax your grip a little bit. If you just saw everything as a bunch of junk, how would that change the way you live? You see, it seems to me that that's the kind of attitude the Apostle Paul has when he writes to the Philippians. An attitude that saw everything he owned and everything he was, every other privilege and pursuit in this world, as a bunch of junk compared to knowing Jesus. I mean, you can hear it, can't you? He lists, he lists all those good things in verses 4, 5, and 6. He says, if anyone else has a reason to be confident in the flesh. In other words, if anybody else has got bragging rights, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, member of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, the law, I'm a Pharisee, persecutor of the church, I am blameless. Paul says, if you've got a reason to brag, Don't worry, we'll get in a spitting contest and I'll win. That's what he says. Paul's given his resume, his curriculum vitae, his qualifications as to the one, as as one to whom all others who are pursuing a life lived in confidence in their own pedigree and in their own accomplishments, they have to live up to Paul. If there were folks at Philippi who believed their works and their abiding by the law of Moses were the way to righteousness, Paul says, essentially, you don't come close. To me, Paul was a Jew par excellence, circumcised on the eighth day as a good Jew is. Not a convert, not someone whose parents were too lazy to take him down to the synagogue two weeks later. On the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, born from the beloved tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, probably kept the language that no one else was speaking at the time, kept it alive in his home. As to the law, he says, I'm a Pharisee. That meant he didn't just take the letter of the law seriously, but all the traditions that surrounded it, all the the interpretations, all of those things, Paul took them literally. He was zealous, so zealous, in fact, he was willing to kill people, a persecutor of the church. And all of this, Paul said, made him blameless. Not only was he born into the chosen people, not only was Paul uh, uh, ripe with Jewish privilege, He was a Pharisee, carried out not just the written law, all of its interpretations, a fierce persecutor of the church, blameless under his literal interpretation of the law. For all intents and purposes, Paul was the closest thing to being a perfect Jew when it came to gaining righteousness by his own merit. But in spite of his family's heritage, in spite of his upbringing, in spite of being able to to recite the Bible in its real language, in spite of all of that work that Paul had to accomplish, what does he say? Whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. 
And more than that, he says, I regard not just that stuff, everything. Everything is lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. It's as if Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And after spending some time at Simon's house, went back, packed up his birth certificate, took the diplomas off the wall, the trophies off the shelf, flushed his titles down the toilet. Because that's all they were really worth, he says. Especially in the light of knowing Jesus as his Lord. You know, it's almost like Paul has a backwards testimony. Rather than going around saying, you know, I was an awful person before I met Jesus. Ran around, smoked, drank, you know, ran around with people, robbed liquor stores, did all. But then Jesus came into my life and now I bless everybody. That's the way we want to hear it. But Paul doesn't do that. Paul says, no, no, I I had it all. A good name, good position, clean bill of spiritual health, blameless under the law. And then here comes Jesus and messes it all up. Paul isn't bemoaning his list of accomplishments, though, his pedigree of holiness. No, well, actually, what Paul is doing is quite the opposite. He's bragging a little bit, boasting just a little to show the folks at Philippi, to show us that what he's saying is really, really and truly, Paul was the cream of the crop before he met Jesus. The standard that we all try to live to, Paul said, I, I came the closest before he met Jesus. But Jesus didn't come and just wreck it all by setting the bar higher. No, Paul says, Jesus wrecked it all because he took the bar away. He got rid of the bar altogether. You see, it's like this. Jesus did not come into this world to tell us all how daggum awful we are. I mean, Jesus says that. He says, I came not to the world to condemn it, but to save it. He didn't come to say, we had all better straighten out or there's going to be literal hell to pay. He didn't do it. Christ's purpose was not to tell us that the law was inadequate in need of revision and expansion, updating to include more minuscule sins, more ways to fail, more culturally relevant failures. No, more holy hoops to jump through. What Paul is saying to us, what Paul is testifying to us, is that Christ came to completely eliminate the standards by which we wish to judge the righteousness of ourselves and others. And he sought to replace them with the all-surpassing joy of his love and grace. It's as if Paul says, if, God, if God's passing grade was 100, I made 100. If it was 105, you better believe I stayed after class and did all the extra credit. And if God wanted a 10, I gave him an 11. But now, for his sake, Paul says, I have suffered the loss of all things. Regard them as rubbish. A bunch of junk. That's that's the Chris Thomas translation. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ or faith of Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. It's not about how high I can jump. Not about how much money I can make. It isn't about how often your backside warms a pew or the chair in a Sunday school class. It isn't about how many Bible verses you know, how many preachers you listen to on TV, on the radio, their podcast. It isn't about how you vote, what party you belong to, or whether or not you even participate in the process. It isn't about your baggage, your self-made or world-given labels, your education, experience, family pride, or how well-worn the binding on your Bible is. The truth is, When it comes right down to it, it ain't about you in the first place. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Christ. Having faith in Christ and longing to know Christ more. That's what Paul is saying. It isn't about the marks on my record. It isn't about how many strikes I have against me. And it's not about how many accomplishments are on my resume. It isn't about anything I've done at all, good or bad. It's all about Jesus and longing to know him more. Because the truth is, this may shock some of you. I don't have it all figured out. And this may shock even more of you. You don't either. None of us do. 
And this may go further, and this may disappoint some of us. It encourages me. Paul doesn't have it all figured out. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in death, death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained. Paul's wordy. You ever notice that? Not that I've already obtained this or have reached the goal, but I press on to make it mine. Make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Friends, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but this one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on, he says, toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I love that Paul says that. The Paul. Not not somebody you've never, not like the Paul, like my daddy Paul. The Paul says, I want to know Christ. Did you catch that? He wants, the implication is that he doesn't know him already. That there's more about Christ to learn. More to experience. More to take in and transform Paul. Paul even says he's pressing on, forgetting what lies behind him. Not just all those awful things Paul did. But all the good things. His past accomplishments, his accolades. He strives for what lays ahead, the call of God and Christ Jesus. Paul, the apostle Paul, Saint Paul, the writer of three quarters of the New Testament upon which a great deal of Orthodox Christian theology is based. That Paul doesn't seem to have it all figured out. It's as if he says, listen, I want to know Christ. Do I know it all? Have I reached the goal? Do I have it all figured out? Can I draw you a clear picture of what it's all about? No. But I'm pressing on. Because in the end, that's what faith is really all about. To say, I don't know. I've always admired that quality in Christians. The faith to say, I don't know. To cast off lazy platitudes. One-size-fits-all answers, self-serving solutions to problems, to say, I've got it all figured out. Here it is, black and white. To simply say, I don't know. That's what faith is all about, really. To say, I don't know. And still press on. To realize there really isn't anything we can do. No power we possess, no answers we can give that will make us all all right with God. That forces us to rely completely on the grace and love of God in Christ Jesus. Because if there were any answer, if there were any shelf high enough to reach, if there were any any solution to the problem other than Christ, then we don't need him. God didn't need to send him. And that means some of us could be better than someone else. But that's not how it goes. It forces us to rely completely on on the grace and love of God. And when we realize that, when we realize that anything we try, any accomplishments we claim, any power we possess, any gains that we've made in this world really are just a bunch of junk. I mean, fit right there in that dark corner of a thrift store. When we realize that, then then maybe we will begin to see what faith really is all about. For Christ is calling us to cast off that bunch of junk. That stuff that we cling to so tightly in order to prove our righteousness to ourselves and others. To let go, yes, of our faults, our failures, our sins, judgments, yes, but also to let go of the accomplishments we believe make us better than other people. And so may we strive to be like the Apostle Paul, forgetting what lies behind, the good, the bad, the ugly, and straining forward to what lies ahead, pressing on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. For really, in light of that, it is all just a bunch of junk. So starting today, Let's clean out that pile of junk we've been clinging to so tightly. Hoping it would justify us, make us righteous, 
prove that we are somehow wholly better than all them other folks. Starting today, right now, may we forget what lies behind us, sins, failures, accolades, accomplishments, the whole nine yards, and press on forward in this wonderful journey of knowing Christ, whose love far outweighs whatever faults and self-righteousness we may carry with us. Let us press on toward the call of God in Christ Jesus and get rid of that bunch of junk. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we want to know you. We want to know you more today than we did yesterday. We want to love you more deeply today than we did yesterday. We want to forget the things behind us and press on to what you have in store ahead of us. So help us, Lord, to do that. Give us strength. Give us your Holy Spirit. Humble us, Lord, in the light of our self-righteousness. Encourage us, Lord, in the depths of our self-loathing. God, help us to shed all the junk in our lives. Sins, bragging rights, and all. That we may come to you as you would have us. Completely and totally yours. So Holy Spirit, move in this place now. Help us, Lord, to lay aside whatever junk we brought in here with us. And never pick it up again as we strive forward in the upward call that you've given us in our Lord Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen. Stand with us, would you? 376. As you go out from this place, may you focus forward on the upward call of God in Christ Jesus and leave sitting right there on the pew beside you that bunch of junk you brought in with you and never pick it up again. Let us pray together. Lord Christ, go with us from this place, Lord, calling us to be your people. Help us to be your hands and feet as we press on forward, ever forward to knowing you more. In your name we pray. Amen.